From Al Capone to Albert Anastasia to Paul Castellano, Mafia members have been a known part of the underworld. Their infamous acts have been a source of pain for some, as well as a source of inspiration for TV shows such as The Sopranos. We've all seen those iconic mob movies and heard tales of their power and influence on the streets, but know that these people are some of the most dangerous criminals in the world. So what happens when these ruthless individuals find themselves locked away from the very society they once controlled? Let's find out. To really understand how Mafia members are treated in prison, we have to start with one of the most notable Mafia members there is, Michael Franzese. A quick bio on Michael Franzese. Michael Franzese, born on May 27, 1951 in Brooklyn, New York City, had an intriguing family history. He initially had doubts about his biological father, believing that he had been adopted by John Sonny Franzese, a high-ranking member of the Colombo crime family. Michael thought his biological father was Frank Grillo, whom his mother had divorced. However, it was later revealed that that John, who was already married with three children, had fathered Michael with Cristina Capobianco, a woman he had an affair with. To avoid scandal, Capobianco married Grillo. Later, John divorced his first wife, Grillo disappeared, and John married Capobianco. Michael Franzese grew up on Long Island, but his father initially discouraged his involvement in organized crime. However, when John was sentenced to 50 years in prison for bank robbery in 1967, Michael dropped out of college in 1971 to help support his family financially. In April 1985, Franzese was acquitted of racketeering charges. However, later that year, he faced charges related to counterfeiting and extortion from a gasoline bootlegging racket in Florida and New York. Joseph Iorisso, who had already been sentenced to five years and placed in the witness protection program for his involvement in theft and tax evasion, testified against Franzese and others involved. Eventually, in March 1986, Franzese pleaded guilty to racketeering conspiracy and tax conspiracy charges. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison, ordered to pay restitution, and had to sell his assets. Franzese also faced state racketeering charges in Florida and was sentenced to nine years in prison, running concurrently with his federal sentence. He was ordered to pay additional restitution to the state of Florida. During this time, he was called to testify at the trial of a man named Walters, who had invoked Franzese's name to intimidate college athletes. In exchange for his testimony, Franzese received immunity from prosecution in the Walters case. Walters was found guilty, and Franzese was released on parole after serving 43 months. However, it did not just end for Franzese. In 1991, Franzese was sentenced to four years in federal prison for violating probation requirements. He had been arrested in Los Angeles on tax fraud charges. Prosecutors criticized Franzese for not making court-ordered restitution payments promptly and considered him a con man. After his release in 1994, Franzese retired from the mob in 1995 and moved to California with his family due to death threats and contracts on his life, including one approved by his own father. Since his release, Franzese has publicly denounced and distanced himself from his past life in organized crime, emphasizing the negative aspects of that lifestyle and expressing remorse. He emphasizes that he does not glamorize his previous involvement in the mob, acknowledging it as an evil path. But one thing he talks so much about is his life in prison. Michael's journey began at Metropolitan Correctional Center, New York, and from there he was transferred to various locations such as Phoenix, Arizona, Terminal Island, Sheridan, Oregon, and El Reno, Oklahoma. For him, within the realm of made men in prison, fear is not rooted in the intimidation of any single individual. Instead, it revolves around the potential consequences consequences that arise from making a grave mistake. Essentially, the fear you experience in prison is not linked to any particular individual. Every made man has the capability to inflict harm on you, and knowing this is crucial for any mafia member while incarcerated. When you're a made guy, you're not in fear of any one guy. Because everybody that took that oath is capable of doing damage. And that's why respect holds immense value in the prison system. Many inmates seek the respect they might have lacked in their former lives. So embracing the power of courtesy and politeness can significantly contribute to survival and navigating the intricate social dynamics. As always, the fundamentals are still as important as ever, which is saying please, thank you, and excuse me. Michael Franzese recounts a unique incident during his transfer to Terminal Island. Having spent a substantial portion of his life either in incarcerated or visiting prisons. Franzese can attest to the necessity of adapting to the prison environment. Adapting becomes imperative because there are no alternatives, and the ability to survive in prison relies heavily on one's resilience. Coping mechanisms, mental fortitude, and the support of like-minded individuals are pivotal in facing the challenges of prison life. For Franzese, it was his family and the Bible that kept him going. When he was in prison in 1991, he faced solitary confinement, not because he was a danger to other inmates, but because the feds saw others as a danger to him. 
him, or so they said. It was one of the most challenging experiences he had encountered. He spent 29 months and 7 days in a place known as The Hole. The prolonged isolation proved mentally and emotionally taxing. This would be one of the worst days of his life. He would silently hope that death came as he slept. He wouldn't want to see anyone. He wouldn't want anyone close to him. He just wanted to be left alone. Now, I wasn't suicidal that night. I wasn't that brave. But honestly, I wanted to lay my head on that cot and just not wake up. To maintain his sanity during this trying period, Michael turned to books, devouring around 400 of them. His Sony Walkman became a source of solace as he immersed himself in music, and reading the Bible provided comfort and guidance. This Bible was given to him by a correction officer who saw him suffering during his incarceration. In addition, he exercised within his cell and occasionally enjoyed alone time in the yard. Staying connected with his family through phone calls was vital, as it provided a lifeline to the outside world. These coping mechanisms enabled him to enjoy endure the hardships of solitary confinement. Understanding the complex power dynamics and adapting accordingly contribute to resilience and survival in prison as a mafia member. As the only white inmate amidst a group of 250 black inmates, he initially faced taunts and threats, not because of his skin color, but because he was seen as new meat when he was first transferred there. And in prison, people will always try to push your buttons to get a reaction out of you, or honestly just because they want to. I mean, these are still criminals that are locked up. However, when news of his background as a mob member reached them through a television news flash, the situation took an unexpected turn. The inmates recognized him and applauded his presence, providing him with a sense of respect and security. Fear is another prevalent emotion within the prison hierarchy. Inmates often experience fear due to potential consequences for crossing boundaries or showing disrespect. Retribution from fellow inmates or rival factions can range from physical violence to social isolation and marginalization. Fear becomes a mechanism for maintaining order, enforcing loyalty, and deterring individuals from challenging the established power dynamics. For Michael Franzese, the realization that earning respect would alleviate fear within the prison environment was everything. While respect does not make one weak or cowardly, it provides a certain level of protection and a smoother path during incarceration. By adhering to the unwritten rules and norms, he successfully avoided any confrontations or issues throughout his time in prison. However, fear and the absence of respect can have significant consequences within the prison hierarchy. In an environment where power dynamics constantly shift, it can be exploited by those in positions of authority, such as correctional officers. To these correctional officers, they've been told all their lives that mafia members are the worst of the worst, and their actions towards them as prisoners show this inherent bias. While maintaining order is essential, fostering an environment of constant intimidation and tension can perpetuate a cycle of fear. This can be terrible for everyone involved. For mafia members who fail to earn or maintain respect, life can be difficult. Without the protection and support of a respected social circle, they may become targets for manipulation, abuse, or victim the fear of isolation, harm, or ostracization can have detrimental effects on an individual's mental and emotional well-being, leading to heightened anxiety and the constant need for self-preservation. When it comes to the lives of those behind bars, it is a path that few willingly choose. Michael Franzese, who experienced prison firsthand, strongly advises against becoming an expert in prison life unless involved in prison ministry with a genuine desire to help others. Franzese has a medallion he wears. It is a dog tag that bears the word remade. This medallion carries deep significance significance as it symbolizes Michael's personal journey of transformation. In 1975, he was made when he entered a life of crime, but later he was remade when he found faith. This was in relation to the correctional officer who gave him a Bible when he was solitary. The medallion serves as a constant reminder of his new identity and purpose, and a beacon to the fact that mafia members being treated with humanity could impact them positively. These random acts of kindness are everything. Let us explore more realities of made men behind bars through the life of Michael Franzese. Another significant aspect of prison life is the phenomenon known as diesel therapy. This practice is considered one of the most difficult aspects of serving time in the federal system. It involves being abruptly transported to unknown locations in the middle of the night. Handcuffed to seats on planes that have been seized from drug dealers, the experience is both unsettling and precarious. The constant movement between prisons leaves no opportunity for inmates to settle in or establish connections. It is a deliberate tactic employed by authorities to exert control and pressure. During Michael's encounter with diesel therapy, he he spent several months being shuttled between prisons while authorities attempted to break him down. It was an immensely challenging period. However, as the saying goes, one adapts to survive. When options are stripped away, individuals often discover an inner strength they never knew they possessed. In prison, where choices are limited, the capacity for endurance and resilience becomes evident. Among the various prisons Michael encountered, Terminal Island in California holds some positive memories. It stands out as a comparatively good place to serve time, offering separate sections known as the North Yard and South 
South Yard. The South Yard, in particular, provides individual rooms instead of dormitories, granting inmates their personal space. Situated in San Pedro, Terminal Island offers a scenic view of passing boats, which can serve as a welcome distraction during yard time. The pleasant weather of California adds to the overall experience. On weekends, a special treat awaited the inmates as boats filled with women would pass, generating excitement and anticipation. Inmates would eagerly rush to the fences, hoping for a glimpse or interaction with the women on the boats. These moments provided a brief respite from the challenges of prison life and a connection to the outside world. There's a chance for positive interaction with the guards there, especially if the inmate is known not to cause any problems. However, sometimes mafia members in prison could come across a case manager or officers who had a dislike for them. For Michael Franzese, it was an officer. She believed that all mob guys were disrespectful to women and treated them poorly, although he knew this was not true. She constantly gave him a hard time. One day, she passed by his cell and noticed a black and white television he had managed to acquire. She confiscated it, wrote him up a disciplinary report, and gave him a shot, which could have had negative consequences for his sentence. However, he managed to get the television back and resolved the issue with the help of a Mexican lieutenant who was familiar with him. During his time in Terminal Island, he had several conveniences. He also had a bunkmate named Rosario Sal Gambino, a member of Angelo Bruno's crew from Philadelphia. They became good friends. And even though Sal received a 45-year sentence on a drug case and was eventually deported to Italy, their families remained close. Terminal Island was considered the best place for him to serve his time, as there were many other mob guys there, such as Pete Milano and Sam Shertito, with whom he got along. They often shared stories, but he mostly kept to himself and played cards. The South Yard, where he was housed, was known for its relatively peaceful environment. In prison, there's a need to understand the importance of respecting others' time. The phone area is a hot spot for conflicts and violence, and Michael usually witnessed fights and stabbings over phone usage. In one instance, after hanging up the phone and returning to the dormitory, he was grazed by a punch from someone who mistook him for another person. He instinctively went after the young man, but realized it was a misunderstanding. He forgave him, and the situation was resolved peacefully. In another incident, while in L.A. County Jail, he was locked down in a 24-hour confinement unit. There was only one phone, which he desperately needed for his case. Upon hearing that a fellow inmate planned to stab him to secure a transfer to the penitentiary, he confronted the person. He made it clear that he wouldn't tolerate any violence. Fortunately, the situation was diffused without any harm coming to him. Michael Franzese may have been lucky in both instances, but that's not the case for mafia members in prison, such as when Gambino family boss John Gotti was beaten in prison despite his status at the time, so it's always best to stay on guard. Next, I will talk about how Mafia members were treated in prison through the eyes of a known ex-Mafia member, Salvatore Gravano, known as Sammy the Bull. A quick history of the infamous Salvatore Gravano. He came into this world on March 12, 1945. Growing up in the vibrant neighborhood of Bensonhurst in Brooklyn, predominantly inhabited by hard-working Italian Americans, Gravano's parents, both hailing from Sicily, found success as dress manufacturers with the help of a generous investor. Their prosperity allowed them to acquire a summer cottage on Long Island, adding a touch of comfort to their lives. From an early age, Gravano faced a unique challenge in the form of severe dyslexia. Unfortunately, this learning disability went undetected by his teachers, resulting in him being held back in the fourth grade. The humiliation he experienced triggered a violent response within him. Frustrated with the education system, Gravano decided to abandon formal schooling on his 16th birthday. And at 18, Gravano's encounters with the law began. In an act of aggression, he assaulted a police officer who had been harassing him. Shortly after that, he found himself in a lumberyard during an attempted burglary, resulting in his arrest. Despite these criminal offenses, Gravano managed to escape imprisonment, facing only fines as penalties. His lawyer skillfully negotiated on his behalf, suggesting that Gravano would enlist in the army to avoid jail time. True to his word, Gravano enlisted in 1964 and served as a corporal until his honorable discharge. In 1968, Gravano's path intersected with Shorty Sparrow, an associate of the notorious Colombo crime family. This encounter marked a turning point in Gravano's life as he delved into the world of organized crime, engaging in a series of predatory acts, including store and bank robberies, Gravano also found himself involved in the management of after-hours clubs. While still involved in criminal activities, Gravano ventured into legitimate business ventures. He opened a store specializing in women's clothing and accessories. Still, his plans were disrupted when he discovered that one of his assistants, Ralph Sparrow, Shorty Sparrow's brother, was deceiving him. To avoid further conflicts, Gravano heeded the advice of Shorty Sparrow and transitioned to the Gambino family, becoming a member of Salvatore Tato Arello's crew. Expanding his business interests, 
August, Gravano opened additional successful after-hours clubs and operated a popular discotheque in Brooklyn. In 1980, he orchestrated the murder of John Johnny Keys Simone on the orders of Paul Castellano, who was engaged in a power struggle with Nicky Scarfo for control over Philadelphia's Cosa Nostra family. Two years later, Gravano himself ordered the killing of Frank Fiala, a Czech-born cocaine dealer who had acquired Gravano's discotheque and office building. Fiala's failure to pay the full amount of $1 million triggered Gravano's fury. Although this unauthorized murder could have led to Gravano facing Cosa Nostra's death penalty, he received a pardon from Castellano. While Gravano managed to avoid the consequences of his actions, the murder of Fiala prompted an IRS investigation. Consequently, Gravano faced charges of tax evasion but was ultimately acquitted. However, in February of the year 2000, Salvatore Gravano found himself facing a significant turning point in his life. Alongside almost 40 other individuals, including his ex-wife Deborah, daughter Karen, and son Gerard, he was arrested on federal and state drug charges. The legal consequences were severe. In 2002, Gravano received a 20-year prison sentence in New York, followed by an additional 19-year sentence in Arizona to be served concurrently. The weight of the conviction seemed to signify a prolonged period behind bars, with his expected release date set for March 2019. However, fate took an unexpected turn when Gravano was granted early release in September 2017. Now we'll look at how Mafia members are treated through his eyes. Life within the confines of a prison presents a unique set of circumstances, especially when it comes to the intricate web of human relationships. Throughout incarceration, Sammy managed to establish a positive rapport with their fellow inmates, regardless of race or ethnicity. His interactions were characterized by harmony and camaraderie. Engaging in activities such as gym workouts and sparring sessions together, they all demonstrated a genuine willingness to connect and build meaningful bonds. However, one incident particularly struck a chord with him. He witnessed a fellow black inmate subjected to derogatory slurs and treatment while he was serving food at the cafeteria. Despite the apparent indifference exhibited by the target of the racial insults, he felt a need to intervene. He used the spoon he used to serve food to hit the racist. Regrettably, his noble intentions escalated the situation, resulting in a physical altercation. The arrival of officers added a twist to the unfolding drama. However, after the officers heard what happened, they left them. But some consequences followed suit. He was relegated to menial tasks in the back, peeling potatoes without the trust of wielding a spoon. The incident served as a poignant reminder of the futility of trying to inflict harm using a spoon. He also recounts another incident wherein he shared a cell with a prejudiced inmate, a long-haired, bearded biker. Despite their stark differences, they endeavored to coexist within the confined space, engaging in conversations, albeit with occasional friction. But the inmate's racist inclinations were evident as he displayed discomfort whenever interracial relationships were portrayed on television. An additional source of contention came up when the inmate's untidiness clashed with Sammy's sense of cleanliness, sparkling heated argument. However, what really struck a chord with him was when the racist inmate made a direct attack on Sammy's daughter's interracial relationship. Eventually, the simmering tensions reached a boiling point, resulting in a night-long physical confrontation. The following day, his neighboring inmate, curious about the commotion, inquired about the events that transpired. Their response was nonchalant but revealing. They simply stated that they had fought throughout the night. Yes, throughout the night. Although the atmosphere was tense, they managed to keep the specifics of the conflict concealed. However, when summoned by the unit manager for a meeting, suspicions surrounding the altercation were aroused. During the meeting, the unit manager confronted Sammy, disclosing that the racist inmate had accused him of engaging in a racially motivated fight. In response, he chose to downplay the incident, neither confirming nor denying the allegations. The unit manager in turn offered guidance, urging them to avoid further conflicts and maintain a peaceful environment going forward. This story from Sammy's time in prison offers valuable insights into the intricate dynamics of relationships and tensions within the prison system. It serves as a lens to view the challenges of coexistence, the unpredictability of circumstances, and the delicate equilibrium required to navigate such an environment. In the cramped confines of his cell, the two inmates found themselves engaged in a relentless battle of physical prowess. Their fights, fueled by anger and frustration, lasted for hours on end. Each blow exchanged showcased their determination to assert dominance over the other. The physical toll was immense, leaving them battered, bloodied, and exhausted. Yet, amidst the chaos, there was an unspoken understanding that these fights were not intended to be fatal, but rather a way to release pent-up emotions and assert their strength within the prison hierarchy. Despite their fierce battles, an unexpected connection emerged between the two inmates. In the face of a shared struggle, they found solace in their shared experiences and formed a unique bond. When the guard's footsteps faded away and the door locked, they could momentarily let go of their hatred and find moments of respite. Exhausted and bruised, they eventually found a way to coexist, allowing sleep to overcome them in the darkened cell. This reaction and this surprising unique need for connection, despite the shared hatred for each other, is part of the complex ecosystem that mafia members have to exist in and navigate. Think of it this way.
way. When locked up, you're drained of connection, and you strive to form these bonds, sometimes even with enemies. But sometimes you don't even get the chance to form any connection at all and get thrown into a supermax prison. This is reserved for the worst of the worst. Some of the mafia members that are deemed to be dangerous are shipped to the ADX supermax prison. This was a prison made for inmates who they lose control of. They're killing people in other prisons. They don't know how to manage them. They don't know what to do with them. This is where you end up. This is the max. The Supermax. When Sammy was apprehended in February 2000, he faced a long sentence, first with the state and then with the federal system. But his journey into the prison world began in the maximum security unit, commonly referred to as the hole. In this secluded environment, he endured six and a half years of continuous isolation. Any movement to different areas within the prison led to more time spent in solitary confinement. As a mafia member, upon arrival, you're confronted with a stark reality. Each cell contained only a 12-inch black and white TV with no sound, a shower and a concrete slab for a bed. You have to use an earpiece to listen to the TV. The provided mattress was a thin plastic sheet, barely an inch thick, and there were no pillows. Life in the Supermax as a Mafia member was highly controlled. Inmates were not allowed to touch the bars, separating them from the outside world. Violating this rule would result in punishment from the correctional officers who carried batons for enforcement. The soundproof environment made it nearly impossible for inmates to communicate with one another, fostering an intense sense of isolation. Also, communication with prison staff Staff was strictly limited. In essence, the silence could be deafening. Meals were delivered through a steel door slot. The food served to the inmates in the Supermax was prepared in another prison and transported to the facility. Due to the logistical process, meals often sat for an hour and a half, sometimes longer, before reaching the inmates. The quality of the food was questionable, and the limited variety provided little comfort in an otherwise harsh environment. In the Supermax, communication with the outside world was heavily monitored and restricted. Inmates were permitted one phone call per month, and even these calls were under constant scrutiny. Any unfavorable remarks or content could lead to immediate termination of the call by prison staff who listened to the call. After a year of good behavior, inmates could earn the privilege of two phone calls per month, but the level of surveillance remained the same. One of the most challenging aspects of prison life for this former mafia member was the overwhelming loneliness. From the moment he entered the system, he found himself lonely in maximum security settings, spending six and a half years in solitary confinement 20 feet below ground. I knew when I was there, this was hell. But hell hath no fury like a supermax prison, because for most it was worse than death. Security measures in the supermax facility were extreme. Every movement was heavily monitored. Stepping into the prison yard was like entering a war zone. Inmates were constantly subjected to strip searches upon leaving their cells. These searches involved complete nudity, bending over, and coughing to ensure nothing was concealed. In extreme cases, a cavity search could be conducted to detect hidden contraband. The loss of privacy and dignity was a daily occurrence. Failure to comply with orders or engage in fights in the yard would result in severe consequences, such as being shot with rubber bullets or subjected to physical beatings by correctional officers. If caught with a shank, you will be shot with real bullets. The constant presence of baton-wielding guards further reinforced the oppressive atmosphere. Sammy described his experience in the facility as pathetic, a feeling that can consume a person's soul. In the midst of this desolation, a glimmer of human connection appeared when a nurse, a good-looking woman, crossed his path. In their brief encounters, he found solace and empathy in her presence. However, his desperation for human contact led to a moment of vulnerability and desperation. He grabbed her finger, pleading with her not to leave, seeking any form of conversation and connection. Though she urged him to let go, warning him of the cameras and potential consequences, the encounter left a lasting impact on both of them. With tears in her eyes, she told him to hold one. She looked at him through eyes that saw not only a made man that had committed atrocities and deserved to be there, but also one that saw humanity in him. In addition to the emotional challenges, the physical dangers within prison walls, walls were ever present. The sounds of concussion bombs exploding served as a chilling reminder of the violence that could erupt at any moment. These bombs were used when someone lost control or went on a rampage, resulting in swift and brutal retaliation from the prison staff armed with batons. The rules were clear. Comply or face severe consequences. Visits from loved ones offered a flicker of hope, a temporary respite from the bleakness of prison life. However, even these moments were tainted by dehumanization. The visitation area was separated by thick 
glass, preventing physical contact. Communication was limited to a phone, with cameras monitoring every movement. Sammy described one of his ex-wife's visits. When she visited, she was eating chips and drinks she got from a vending machine in the lobby. While he was handed food and instructed to eat with his bare hands, this stark contrast in their experiences was too much for him. During the visit, he requested to use the bathroom. He was escorted to a cage-like area with no privacy. A female guard stood by, watching him poop, refusing to grant him any semblance of privacy. The humiliation he felt was immeasurable, as he was forced to relieve himself in a degrading manner. These stories illustrate just a fraction of the harsh realities Mafia members face within the prison system. The inhumane conditions, constant surveillance, and loss of personal autonomy serve as a constant reminder of the punishment and isolation endured by these incarcerated men. But you know the worst of it, you've not heard the worst of it yet. There's the existence of a hidden punishment area within the prison, known as the hole within the hole. For those inmates that choose to be very stubborn, this underground space consists of a concrete slab with stirrups to restrain prisoners fully nude. If they need to pee or poo, they must do it right there, and then wait for a hosing to clean the space up. The psychological torment of such an environment is unimaginable. According to Sammy, there's a stark difference between how mafia members, cartel bosses, and others in the Supermax prison are treated versus other high-level prisoners in other prisons. Terrorists detained at Guantanamo Bay seemingly receive more humane treatment, including access to amenities and better medical care. Sammy argues that prisoners at ADX Supermax, including himself, would willingly trade places due to their oppressive and depressive environment. Imprisoned as a mafia member, isolation and brutality defines most of their life. For some, it's hell, and for others, it's just another sentence to serve. However, for all, it's wasted years. But is it worth the punishment? Was it deserved or excessively harsh? The verdict remains uncertain, and for you, the viewers, to decide. Thanks for watching.